friends, and welcome to another edition of In With The Old. We are a video podcast focused on dispelling myths, building appreciation for God's Word, and helping you rediscover the Old Testament for the life of faith. My name is Dr. Tim Howe, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Brian Coney, as we go through the book of Ruth. Dr. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm excited. We're in the home stretch. We have Just about two more episodes in the book of Ruth. We're going to be finishing out chapter four, both this week and next, Tim. Then we have one last week where we'll kind of wrap up the book, give some of our final thoughts, observations, talk about where the story fits in. Uh, But it's been a good ride. I think there's been some good engagement and excitement from our audience. And so listeners, I hope you've not only enjoyed this, I hope you're ready for more because we're going to keep this going. Once we're done with Ruth, we aren't announcing our next book yet, but we'll be going straight into another series on one of our favorite Old Testament books. But that's looking to the future. Dr. Tim, why don't we get to the main event? Let's talk about Ruth chapter four today. All right. Awesome. Yes, today we are in Ruth chapter four, doing a verse by verse video commentary. And uh, as is our want, I'm going to read the text and uh, we're going to go through 10 verses today in Ruth chapter four, starting in verse one from the Christian Standard Bible. It says this, Boaz went to the gate of the town and sat down there. Soon the family redeemer Boaz had spoken about came by and Boaz said, come over here and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took 10 men of the town's elders and said, sit here. And they sat down. And he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from the territory of Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you. Buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, do it. But if you do not want to redeem it, Tell me so that I will know, because there isn't anyone other than you to redeem it, and I am next after you. I want to redeem it, he answered. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from Naomi, you will acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. And the Redeemer replied, I can't redeem it myself, or I will ruin my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption, because I can't redeem it. At an earlier period in Israel, a man removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make any matter legally binding concerning the right of redemption or the exchange of property. This was the method of legally binding a transaction in Israel. So the redeemer removed his sandal and said to Boaz, buy back the property yourself. Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife, to perpetuate the diseased, the deceased man's name on his property so that his name will not disappear among his relatives or from the gate of his hometown. You are witnesses today. Well, Brian, as uh, we come to chapter four, of course, we're continuing on the heels of the threshing floor. Uh, dawn has has come. Ruth goes back to Naomi. She doesn't go empty handed. She tells Naomi everything that's transpired. And now we see Boaz is a man of action. Uh, Naomi's words come true, do they not? That he will not rest until this matter is settled. Uh, So Brian, maybe you can walk us through the the first verse here and and get us into chapter four. How do you see this narrative progressing and, and what are some observations you have for us? Yeah, so if we've been following along with Ruth as an excellent story, uh, this is the high point. This is the critical scene. Uh, and it's going to be quite interesting, this dialogue that Boaz is going to have with this kinsman redeemer. Uh, there's a couple layers to it that we're going to unpack. But we're struck right away with the immediacy, right? It begins in verse 1. Boaz went, or now Boaz went in some translations, right? Naomi is correct. Boaz is not going to sit on his hands. He's not going to mull it over. We instantly jump forward from the the scene on the threshing floor where Ruth proposes to Boaz. We see him immediately step into action and go to the gate of the town. Now, Tim, you and I know that if you want to find where do people congregate, that changes depending on culture and time. Uh, When I was a teenager, it would be, hey, let's go hang out at the mall. I don't know if you've been to a mall recently. People don't seem to congregate there as much, or at least not in the mall in my town. Uh, But in this time, if you want to see where would everyone congregate, where would business take place, it would happen at the gates of the town. 
And it makes sense. You could see people traveling both in and out of the town. You could sit in the shade of the walls. Remember, we are in a place that has uh, higher temperatures. Being from a desert myself, I get it. Shade is incredibly important. Uh, and so we are in the gate of a town. It makes sense. And soon we see an individual walking by that Boaz wants to see. Now, Tim, before we even talk about the fun thing with the name of this individual, I love that it's another coincidence. It just so happened to be that the person we need is here. Listeners, how many times has coincidence kind of bubbled to the surface in the story of Ruth? Ruth just happens to go to the field of Boaz, right? They just happen to be related and have this kinsman redeemer relationship as a potential. Now we have the man they need to talk to just so happens to walk by. Much like the story of Esther, Tim, I see God's presence highlighted by the fact that we keep having coincidences move this story along. So I just kind of find it fun and interesting. Now, this kinsman redeemer comes by, and his name is not recorded. We'll talk about that in a second. But Tim, he has a fun way we refer to him in the story. How do we refer to him? What's the, uh, the alliteration, shall we say, in Hebrew? Yeah, so in Hebrew, the name of this man is Poloni Almoni, and, yeah. uh, and and that's intended to be kind of funny, right? I mean, something that we can mm -hmm. laugh at, uh, but but it's meant to guard his identity, to protect him, but also, in a sense, it, it it's meant to show uh, his foolishness in this case, right? Uh, yeah. As we look to the book of Ruth, the names uh, are everywhere, right? You have Elimelech, you have Malon, you have Kilion, you have Ruth, you have Orpah, you have Boaz. You have many people who are named, but this man is intentionally not named. Uh, it's kind of like those old detective shows where it says the names are changed to protect the innocent. Uh, well, mm -hmm. in this case, the names are changed to protect the guilty. This is Poloni Almoni. Some would call it Mr. So-and-so. That's not his real name. Uh, but it's really meant to show us as readers, this man is intentionally not named in a sense to protect him, but also because who would want to be named as the person who did not redeem Ruth and uh, and live up to the the billing that he should have. So, right. Yeah. And there's some there's some beautiful poetry. Uh, Mr. So-and-so is a very good translation to get at the idea right in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's a poetic punishment as well. A key function of the Kinsman Redeemer we're going to see in the story is to preserve the name, right, mm. of the dead family member. He's going to pass on that. And as poetic judgment, his name in a book, Tim, as you rightly pointed out, that is chock full of names, his name is not preserved because mm. he's the one that chose not to preserve the name of Malon, who we know in history, and we don't know his name. So I find that uh, from the author an intentional kind of slap down of like, Maybe it protects his identity a little bit, but I think it's more an indictment of he made the wrong choice. He should have been the redeemer, and he walked away from that. Yes. I love it, Brian. And just real quick, that reminds me of the story of the Tower of Babel, right? They wanted to make a name for themselves, mm -hmm. but ironically, none of their names are even recorded. So great insight. I love that. I love that. So we have this individual come by and Boaz says, come over. And then he assembles some elders. Now the elders are there to be adjudicators of what happens, right? Anytime you enter into an arrangement, you want to have witnesses to have someone to say, look, I was there. This was a binding affair agreement, etc." In Leverite law, in Deuteronomy 25, when it talks about leveret marriage, you're supposed to be in the gate of the city with the elders of the city. So Boaz, interestingly, in a time where the book of Judges has said everyone does what is right in their own eyes, mm -hmm. Boaz, I think the story is going out of the way to show, look, he is following the law as it is specified. He's mm -hmm. not just taking the easy way out, which would have been to maybe I could have just slept with Ruth and maybe we do something off of that last time. No. He's going through the proper channels to do things the way they should be done. Mm -hmm. He looks at this kinsman redeemer, this family redeemer, and he says, come sit down. I have a proposition for you. But Tim, he doesn't just come out and say, here's the whole shebang, right? Boaz walks us in on this discussion in a kind of interesting way. How does he open the dialogue with this family redeemer? 
Yeah. So he's, he's again, a man in motion. He's doing these things quickly. He tells the man, sit down. He's, he gets the elders and say, sit down. And then he, his proposition begins by saying, okay, I want everyone to know that Naomi is selling the territory that belonged to Elimelech. She's selling it. And, uh, and this is a prime opportunity. You know, as I read this, Brian, I think Boaz is is putting the the glamorous, the the incentive first uh, to put it on the kinsman redeemer's mind. Uh, but then he's going to come back with the left hand and say, "Oh, and by the way, the day that you buy this back, you're also going to acquire Ruth the Moabitess and all the responsibilities that go with that." So uh, the setup is interesting, Brian, because uh, as we come to this point in the narrative. We have not been told that there is a portion of the field that belongs to Elimelech. This seems mm-hmm. rather new. It's also interesting that Boaz feels kind of the full authority to act as an agent for Naomi in this, despite the fact that we haven't had any conversation between Boaz and Naomi. Uh, and so there are some gaps that that I think we're meant to fill in here. But of course, Boaz knows if Naomi's plan is for me to redeem Ruth, then surely she is she is okay with me using every means at my disposal to do so. And he seems also to be a fair knew, inference. Yeah. He he also knew as he was engaging with this other kinsman redeemer that there would be pros and cons to redemption and he would need to present it in the right way. And so uh, as we think about though, this portion of the field that belonged to Elimelech. It's interesting uh, when it comes to what the law says about property ownership, what we know is that according to the laws of Jubilee, it wasn't truly possible to permanently sell a piece of land or it wasn't supposed Mm -hmm. to be. And so at least some look at this and say, well, it's not Naomi fully giving the deed as it were of the land over, but rather it's being able to exercise the right to farm the land, to use the land for uh, the purposes of economic gain or fruitfulness and other activity. And so Naomi here, even though she is destitute, she at least has some final card that she can play, some final uh, thing that she can offer. Uh, But Boaz here, he puts that up front. But then as the man responds, uh, how does he respond, Brian? Maybe you can walk us through that response. Yeah, so Boaz puts for this offer that Naomi is going to sell the land or sell Tim. I think you're right that she's selling the rights to work the land. We're we're familiar even in our culture with mineral rights being something distinct from property ownership. Mm-hmm. Um, she's selling some certain rights to her field. It's a good field. Who wants it? And the kinsman redeemer says that sounds good. Now the selling of land, Tim, maybe just as a, a little rabbit trail here was something significant and listeners you might be like well that's weird why does the law of jubilee prevent you from selling your land uh permanently why does it have this idea that it reverts after a certain amount of time well land at least in ancient israel has both a economic and a theological significance Mm -hmm. economically speaking land is how you can improve yourself and better yourself It is your source of making money. If you don't own land, you are a worker in someone else's field and you can never really rise above that station. Um, And so acquiring more land or at least the rights to more land is desirable. But if we're going to have a fair economic system, we should revert it. Right. And that every family has this opportunity to improve themselves. Hmm. Now, I say this, Tim, and you and I both know it's quite tragic. The laws of Jubilee, they're beautiful. They're interesting. They're intricate. And we have no evidence that they ever actually were done (laughs) Um, and they were ignored, which is quite tragic. But beyond just the economic reason, theologically, remember, we're in the promised land. This is the inheritance that Yahweh has given to the sons and daughters of Israel. To sell your land means you have, in an abstract sense, right, no portion in Israel. You have no tie to the covenant promises of Yahweh. Uh, And so it's not a easy or light thing. In fact, we have the story of Naboth's vineyard with King Ahab later that goes to show, right, it is a big deal if you try to purchase land in Israel. Sorry, a little theological aside. We'll come back here. We're selling at least temporarily either the land, the rights to the land. Uh, Boaz does his greatest salesman pitch and the kinsman redeemer says, yes, I like that. And Boaz goes, oh, 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 and one little addendum to that. On the day you buy it, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabitess as the wife of a deceased man to perpetuate the man's name on the property. 
right? Continuation of the family is a big deal. Now, the kinsman redeemer, when he hears this little caveat, goes from I want to redeem it to I can't redeem it, which is fascinating, or I will ruin my inheritance. Now, the word he uses here, uh, Tim, it's quite uh, interesting. This is the same word that uh, is used of Onan uh, in a similar sense in Genesis 38, right? He ruined or wasted his seed on the ground. And in a similar Leverite marriage sense does not produce an heir, continue on the family name. And so we do get, at least from these two stories, an idea that being a kinsman redeemer is not all roses. There is this idea of I'm going to waste resources either of my own, quite literally, or of, you know, finances, time, etc., for the promulgation of someone else's name and legacy. Well, I want to spend that on myself. And I think we get that, especially here in Ruth. Uh, the Redeemer says, I'm going to ruin my own inheritance, which I take that to mean, Tim, he already has kids. He knows that if he goes through with this, he will acquire the additional land. That's awesome. He will also acquire Ruth and be expected to produce kids with her. However, his children will never inherit this field. Any material he puts into it, any money, time he puts into uh, developing this land of Naomi, any children he has with Ruth will inhabit that land and inherit it. But his children will never inherit it. And so there's this idea of why would I. The land's great, but it will never come to be with me. It will revert back to her and her children. I don't want it. So he says, take my right of redemption because I can't redeem it. That's what I see in his response, that he's afraid for his own family and his own promulgation. Tim, what do you make of this kinsman redeemer, this Mr. So-and-so's rejection uh, of Boaz's offer? Yeah, well, it, it comes across as very selfish right? Yeah. Uh, this is oh, the yeah. time when every man does what is right in his own eyes, and he's trying to weigh the field net plus. That's an incentive. But taking care of the widow and the, the, the foreigner, that's something that I cannot do. And for him, I think it was a calculus. There was a short-term benefit in terms of having a land, but there was this long-term uh, deficit in terms of having two more mouths to feed with both Ruth and Naomi, potentially more if children came. But then also there's even the possibility that because Ruth was known to be a widow and known to be childless, that there might not be an heir, at mm. which point he would yeah. just have basically no benefit. He would have two more mouths to feed forever, uh, and he wouldn't even fulfill the lever responsibility, at which point uh, th this man is is put on the hot seat. And I love this. It's interesting because Boaz really kind of tightens the screws on him because he says, on the day that you redeem it, and what is that day? In this moment, you know, mm -hmm. this isn't something that we're going to ask you to go pray about. This is not something that we're going to give you time to consider. On and the you got day a new bride. Come on down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> da -da -da -da. Yeah. You can you can feel the music tense behind this man as he says, you know what, I, I just I will not risk what I'm yeah. guaranteed for the sake of something that I'm not guaranteed. And so he says, and I agree with you, Brian, I see this as as him having a family and him not wanting to risk his family and the security that he had with Ruth the Moabitess. And the last thing I'll say is I think Boaz intentionally calls her. Ruth the Moabitess, you will acquire Ruth yeah. the Moabitess as your wife because uh, he wanted to leverage, in this sense, the social stigma of Ruth in an effort to procure marriage with her. And yeah. it's risky, it's brilliant, it's bold, uh, but he looks at her, uh, looks at this man, and you almost you almost see his eyes. Do you really want to marry Ruth the Moabitess? Yeah, do you want to be really that guy? Yeah. Do you want to do you want to have the responsibility of a foreigner as your mm -hmm. wife for the rest of your life? And of course, Boaz is uh, is here very uh, shrewd as a serpent and innocent as a dove, as Jesus says, uh, mm -hmm. as he has an end in mind and he's willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And so, so Tim, I have this funny image of uh, this kid's been <laughs> redeemer. If if it played out, he comes home at night and he's like, "Honey, I got some good news and bad news. Good news, got some new property. We got it. You know, another orchard. It's great. Um, <laughs> maybe side bad news. Here's my new wife as well. Uh, <laughs> mm. Yeah, uh, right. It, it, he's put in a bind and, and yeah. he backs out of it very quickly. Mm. 
Yeah. Tim, we then get this kind of odd idea in verse seven of uh, we get an aside, right? The author breaks in and says, all right, at a time and period in Israel, a man would remove his sandal to indicate that a transaction had taken place with territory. Um, there's at least two things I take out of this, and then I'd love to hear it, what you make of this kind of interjection. Mm -hmm. um, first, I think this tells us as readers, Ruth is not set any time, or the writing of Ruth, rather, is not set any time around the events of Ruth. I think, as I've said a couple of times, we're in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. One of the big challenges of that day is intermarriage with foreigners. And I think Ruth is supposed to be a polemic or a speaking against what Ezra and Nehemiah say, which is to divorce the foreigner. Here's a righteous foreigner. Why do I think we're so far in the future? Because we have to have an aside that's about to explain the custom. Mm -hmm. If this book is written during the reign, shall we say, of King David, we're only like 100 years in the future. Have customs really changed in three generations? Because that's the actual length of how far we are. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. So I think that gives us that bit of information. It also tells us uh, that the moving of property was so important. You wanted a way to ensure it happened above board. And mm -hmm. the giving of sandals as a covering for the feet in a rocky desert, it's a very important part of the wardrobe and not something you'd easily lose. It was mm -hmm. a great visual representation when a transaction had taken place. It could mm -hmm. be witnessed by the community, which was the key thing. People could see, ah, this has gone down. We know a binding and legal agreement has taken place. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I take that out of verse seven. What do you see in verse seven? Yeah, it's it's a very vivid picture, isn't it? That this is something that that I think mm -hmm. kids yeah. especially love, but adults too. You know that I'm going to take my sandal off. And by the way, we don't know. We don't know if if both sandals were exchanged. If one person gave the sandal to another, it doesn't explain it. Uh, but I totally agree with you. This seems to indicate that a, a long period of time has has passed. Uh, and, and we know, by the way, that later on, say in the book of Jeremiah, in the time of Jeremiah, uh, that they did eventually have deeds to the land. Uh, so yeah. this, this, there is a significant time gap. There is this uh, narrative explanation. I want you to understand why this is happening. Um, and and I, I just want to pause and say, when we think about the transfer of sandals, I love what you how you explained it, Brian. We don't tend to think of sandals or shoes as highly important. But this would have been incredibly valuable to the people who are wearing them and using them. Giving up your sandal is not something you wanted to do unless you were serious about it. So this was something that that indicated uh, this is a, a true thing. This is an important thing. And uh, and so, yeah, it's a fun symbol. It's a way of indicating, again, uh, that this is a formal transaction. This is, as it were, what we would say, sign it on the dotted line. Or in mm -hmm. our culture, sign it on the dotted line 10 times as anyone who's ever closed on a mortgage knows you have to do. Um, <laughs> but Well, in, and this is also a time where you don't have mass manufacturing. Footwear right. is going to be identifiable to the individual. So yeah. I like you, what you said, signature. This is close to that. I think this is a decent analog. Yeah. And, and in the context of there being 10 elders who are there to witness and verify this is mm -hmm. something that everyone would have been able to say, this happened. It wasn't just a verbal agreement. It wasn't just a handshake. We are exchanging something of value. We're exchanging something potentially of symbolic significance in terms of the feet uh, at different times, expressing authority or something being permanent. Uh, I think there of the vision of, say, Jesus in Revelation chapter one, where it says he has feet of bronze uh, that, that tends to speak about his authority or his immovability, uh, that this this is settled. Once the shoes have been exchanged, at least how, that's how I see it in my mind. Uh, once they've been exchanged, this is ratified. This is done. Um, and so in verse eight, the Redeemer removed his sandal. He said to Boaz, buy the property back yourself. And then Boaz gives this speech to the elders. Brian, how, mm -hmm. how do you see this final dialogue of Bo, uh, Boaz to the elders? How do you see that uh, adding to the significance here? Well, the significance is that he's about to name drop every character in the story. I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, to Killian, to Malon. I've acquired Ruth. This is why I said the Mr. So-and-so is a poetic slap in his face. He mm. is the only character that speaks aside from the servants i guess 
um, right back in chapter two, but he's the only character that speaks in this book that isn't named. Um, and it's supposed to be, look, his name is lost to history, but here are the people. Mm. I am doing this thing. I am buying back. I am redeeming this family. He, again, it's beautiful, Tim. You already brought it up. He brought up Ruth the Moabitess maybe to dissuade the, the Mr. So-and-so before. He's not afraid of that stigma. He's not afraid of her history, what society is going to think of her. He says, I've acquired Ruth the Moabitess, right? There's a beautiful embracing of the person uh, rather than what society might think of the person, which really, I think it's one of those things of the story that resonates, right? Time after time, being able to look past uh, what people say of one another, what culture says of one another. Um, and we're given explicitly here at the end of Boaz's speech in verse 10 to why he does this, to perpetuate the deceased man's name on his property so his name will not disappear. You are witness today. And that's a very important phrase that ends the section, right? This is not just we're doing things in the dark. We're doing things man's way. We're doing the easy solution. No, we've gone above board. We've done it by the book. Now witness that I have done this, right? I have acted faithfully. I've acted in accordance with our laws. I've not done what is right in my own eyes. Um, mm. It's a very powerful statement uh, from Boaz here at the end of the chapter. Yeah, it, it is. And there's, there's a lot of practical application here as well. Uh, as, as we think of Boaz, Boaz uh, was protecting Ruth. As he, as he said, she is Ruth the Moabite. Brian, as I look at that, I see Boaz uh, making sure that all of the elders know first that he is aware. I know what mm -hmm. I'm doing. I know who she is. I know where she's come from. Uh, I'm not doing this blindly, but I am accepting responsibility. Also, I want all of you to make sure that you know I'm saying Ruth the Moabite because this is a full acceptance into our community. I'm not marrying her so that I can just love her and be with her. No, I want her to be fully accepted. And as we're going to see, the elders reply shows their full acceptance. But I, I tend to think of it like this. Sometimes we, we like to hide the dark edges and, and try to maybe sneak some things in that we shouldn't. And as we've said, Boaz is a man who believes in walking in the light. He believes that walking in the light is the best way to honor the Lord. It's the best way to protect the people. It's the best way to make sure that everyone can move forward and know we are on the same page. And the last thing I'll say and give you a, a moment to give a final thought, Brian, is I, I love the challenge to trust in God. You know, th this man, Poloni Almoni, ironically felt like he was doing what was best for himself, but in mm -hmm. reality, trusting in his own judgment, trusting in his own wisdom actually resulted in him losing everything. And I think here again of the words of Jesus when he says, take up your cross and follow me. Anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. But anyone who loses his, my, his life for my sake and for the gospel will find it. And this is what Boaz does. He does the right thing. He does it in the right way. He does it at expense to himself. And in placing his life in the Lord's hands, he actually does the wisest thing of all. Others may see this is foolish, but Boaz knew the safest place to be is in the middle of the will of God. So I love mm. this, Brian. And uh, do you have any final thoughts before I bring us home? Yeah, the last two things I want to bring up, just the uh, the Poloni Almoni in many ways is our twin to Elimelech. Uh, Tim, as you both said, they act out of what appears to be wise at the time, but it's wise in their own eyes, right? They try to make the choice they think will bring the best blessing rather than trusting in the plans and purposes of God. It didn't work out well for Elimelech, and here we have a man whose name in a book where names are important, it's quite literally lost to history, right? There is no, you said it so well, Tim, there is no safer place than being in the will of God. Lastly, I just want to again highlight that uh, that Boaz calls her Ruth the Moabitess here. He is making clear everyone knows who she is. He knows who she is, but here's the key thing. And I'm stealing maybe a little bit of thunder for our next episode, Tim. This is the last time she's called Ruth the Moabitess in the entire book. She's only mentioned one more time, but when she is mentioned, she is just simply Ruth. No longer an outsider, no longer under the stigma of her culture, of her heritage. She is simply Ruth, wife of Boaz, 
and in the lineage of someone that is quite important, King David. Just that kind of dropping of the the epitaph, the Moabitus, uh, which has intentionally been kept throughout. We see it drop away now as she is brought in. It's just a beautiful picture. I'll probably bring this up next time. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's just so cool. I couldn't wait for it. Um, but it's a great it's a great kind of speech from Boaz. Next time we'll see how it plays out. But wonderful talk, Tim. Thanks. Yeah, excellent. Uh, this this again is such a compelling story, and uh, and as we think about the Word of God, this is again why this podcast exists. Uh, mm-hmm. We want to help you rediscover the Old Testament for the life of faith, and uh, we hope and we trust that this has encouraged you. Next time we're going to be going through the end of the book, and uh, and then in a couple episodes we're going to be wrapping up this series. Thank you for going on this journey with us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Until then. Stay cool and stay old.